Hi, I'm Tim Berglund with StarTree. Welcome to Pinot 101 Indexes. Oh, I am. Oh, I am. In this module, we're going to cover all nine of these indexes. It's a lot of material. We're not going to go deeply into each one, but it's very important that you have a basic idea uh, what options you have. So once data is ingested into a database like Pino, and, and we'll cover ingest in a different module, but once it's there, everything else is really about reading it, and reading it is really about how it's indexed. So depending on what your data looks like, what your access patterns look like, uh, you really need to know uh, which indexes fit. So let's dive in. Now, before we dive into our first index, the forward index, I want to introduce a key term that we're going to use all over the place, and that's document ID. So document ID is an internal identifier assigned to every row in a table. You can just think of it as a monotonically increasing integer. So every row that gets ingested into every new segment that's created uh, gets a new and unique document ID. So we're going to use that a lot. So with the forward index, very special index, every column gets a forward index. So what it does is it tells you the value corresponding with a particular document ID. Keep in mind, this is on a certain column, and keep in mind that Pino is a columnar database. So the document ID identifies a row, but nowhere in a segment can I go and get that row. I can just go to a particular column using the forward index from the document ID and figure out uh, which value I want to go get. Now, for dictionary encoded columns, remember, those are columns where there maybe aren't so many unique values, at least relative to the number of rows in a segment. Uh, there are relatively few unique values. We call that a low cardinality column. Uh, so for a low cardinality column, uh, that's likely to be dictionary encoded. And for dictionary encoded columns, each unique value is assigned an ID, and the index the forward index stores those in a bit compressed way. So that, that dictionary, in a sense, lives in the index. And we don't really need to go out into some storage of the column itself. We can just get that, that dictionary value right from there. On the other hand, high cardinality columns can be stored as, as raw data, not dictionary encoded uh, at all. But, and that forward index is just going to tell you where in that chunk of the segment you're going to go to get that value. Visually, it would look like this. Now, uh, if you could imagine this one column table, I'm really showing one column, this location column, uh, and this is classical, uh, low cardinality, dictionary encoded stuff. But just to illustrate the purpose, I've got a document ID, zero to four here, and those document IDs are gonna point to those values there. And you see, we are not, because it's dictionary encoded, we're not gonna store it multiple times. Uh, we're just gonna point to that same value from that document ID. That's the forward index. The inverted index is the same thing, just in reverse. And the first time through, that's not a very helpful description, uh, but you'll get it in just a second here. What the inverted index does is it lists documents per value. I give it a value, and it gives me a list of document IDs that have that value. So I want to go look up what are the rows that have the location Littleton. I would use an inverted index for that. There are bitmap inverted indexes that map from each value to now a bitmap of rows. And that gives me this nice constant time way to look up those rows uh, through that, that bitmapped encoding. There are also sorted inverted indexes, and those are appropriate to build on columns where the data is sorted according to those column values. They map the start and end document IDs for each value in the index. Visually, again, just to get the concept across, let's take a look at this. Uh, I've got, notice, I've just flipped around from the forward index, the, the doc ID and the location. Now I am, in essence, querying on the location, and I want a list of the document IDs that have that value. I've got two of them that have Littleton, two of them that have Mountain View, one of them that has Prog, and I get those out of the index. That's the inverted index. Now, the range index. The range index is what you'd do if you decided you really liked the inverted index, right? I, I like the idea of giving you a value and you tell me what rows have that value, but it's not on some low cardinality discrete dimension field like location, like I was showing you before, where you know maybe there's only 300 cities in, in a million rows. It's a, it's a really small set. But what if it's a metric field, something that's 
more continuous in value. Now, I have continuous in scare quotes there because, of course, these are all discrete values. They're, they're numbers stored in a computer. But imagine something that's an integer or a, a real valued thing. That's, that's, that's just some number in a huge range. You're not going to see that low cardinality characteristic like you would in, in something like, like a city. So what we do is we make low cardinality up. We're going to break that metric, that, that numerical value, up into ranges some number of ranges that suits our purposes. And now, suddenly, I have something that looks like a low cardinality column. So instead of, you know, effectively infinitely many values between, say, 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, um, I would have maybe break that up into single degree ranges or five degree ranges. And my goodness, instead of all the real numbers that I can encode between 0 and 100, uh, now I've got 20 things or 100 things. It seems like a very small set. And so the range index does that with numerical values and then applies the inverted index approach to that range. The Bloom filter. Now, this is useful if you've got a dictionary encodable column. So again, something that, that has relatively low cardinality where dictionary encoding is going to make sense. And you know your queries are going to do equality predicates on that. You're going to want to filter in the WHERE clause where this column equals something. So we are going to have on the server potentially many segments that have the data for, for this table, that, that have this server's view of the data in this table. What the Bloom filter index does is give that server a very efficient way of knowing whether it should look in a particular segment for that value. So it helps to know briefly what a Bloom filter is. A Bloom filter is a space efficient in memory data structure that represents a large set of things. So that large set of things is too big to fit in memory, but the Bloom filter shrinks the size of it and lets us test for the existence of a member in the set. Again, this is for equality predicates in some, uh, you know, some, some set of values. So we want to know is this value for this column in this segment or is it not? What a Bloom filter will tell us is definitely no or maybe yes. Now, why maybe? Well, because again, uh, we're shrinking things, right? There's too many things to fit in memory. We want to make this space efficient data structure. And what we give up in return for, for the shrinkage, the space efficiency there, is the probability that we get a false positive. And this is fine, because if the server is gets the answer, no, this value is not in this segment, but it's definitely not, then, then fine. Don't look in the segment, move on, uh, go to the next segment. If it gets the, the answer yes from the Bloom filter, but it was a wild goose chase and a false positive, and it's not actually in the segment, well, all we did was waste time. We didn't get incorrect results. So Bloom filters are great for this kind of thing. It's just a way of increasing the performance of equality predicates on dictionary encoded columns. That, that sounds like a lot of qualifiers there, but that's the kind of thing that shows up in queries often enough, and it's great to have this index around. There are actually two kinds of text indexes in Pinot. There is an integrated Lucene text index and the native text index. In summary, I'll say that choosing the text search index, which is the, the Lucene, kind of the embedded Lucene index, uh, will offer more features, more flexibility, and the native text index built into Pino uh, covers the common text search use cases over unstructured blobs of text. This is for you know, kind of for blob type text fields. Uh, and that native text index type uh, is going to cover fewer use cases, still the common ones, uh, at higher performance. So you've got those two choices for indexing text fields when you've got a text blob column that's unstructured that you need to work with in queries. Now, the data you ingest into Pino may be JSON data. There may be JSON messages in a Kafka topic, may have giant piles of JSON lying around in S3 that you need to ingest into an offline table, and you may have a column that has a JSON object in it. So regardless of how your data is serialized, you might have a column that's JSON data. The JSON index is designed to accelerate filtering 
on those effectively those JSON dimension columns, they're likely to be dimensions, without scanning necessarily and, and reconstituting that whole JSON object. So it's a performant way of indexing into structured JSON that's in a column. And there are a number of things we can do here. I've got a little bit of sample JSON data on the left there. So I can do a simple key lookup, right? I wanna say, hey, uh, the, that name field, that's a top level field, if that's Adam, uh, well, there's my there's my filter. I want to filter that table based on that. Uh, I can I can chain into embedded objects. I have an array called addresses, and I can say, look, I don't care uh, what element of the array it is. If it's anywhere in that array, the number field uh, of the object in that array is one twelve. There's my filter. I can combine these things. I've got that top level field. I want the name to be Adam, and the one of the addresses to have the number one twelve. That's a oddly specific filter criteria there, but it's possible with the JSON index. And of course, specific array access. If I wanted to know a particular array element, uh, I can index into it like that. These are all performant ways of filtering based on a JSON field in my table without having to either destructure it uh, and kind of flatten it out uh, on import or do too much computational work uh, on read and, and be able to still to get query performance that we could be happy with. The timestamp index is really a lot like the range index, just works with timestamp fields. And uh, instead of specifying anything about a range, we just specify a time grain and it expects to, to parse that date time field according to that grain. So we can build a timestamp index with grains of milliseconds or seconds or minutes, or hours, days, uh, kind of whatever grain makes sense uh, for our data and the kinds of queries we wanna run. And so if we have a timestamp there that if you just look at that timestamp data, that's going down to the, to the minute it looks like. For some reason, seconds and, and milliseconds didn't make it into this one. But I don't care about the minute, I care about the day. So what this index does is make its own hidden column that is effectively that timestamp with uh, hour and minute uh, zeroed out. And so we really just have day resolution now and now apply a range index to that. And I've got effective lookup of the documents per day instead of per minute. Uber has been an early adopter of Pinot and a very important community contributor to the code. And Uber, of course, is in the business of things in places. Uh, cars, meal delivery, uh, location matters a lot. And so they contributed their H3 library, which is kind of their geospatial engine, uh, into Apache Pinot as a geospatial index. This gives us geospatial support compliant with the Open Geospatial Consortium's OpenGIS specifications. And all the gang are there. We get data types like point, line, polygon, functions that define uh, relationships and, and properties like distance, area, within, you know, is this point within this polygon, things like that. And, and this is really a deep dive all in itself, uh, a rich topic almost worthy of its own course. Uh, but the basic idea is it divides the world up into hexagons. So if you're new to geospatial databases, but uh, you're not new to desktop role-playing games, this might just seem very familiar to you. But yeah, the world is divided up into hexagons of various sizes. And this lets us filter our data based on those geospatial predicates like distance and within-ness and things like that. So very, very important, absolutely essential to some use cases Nice to know it's here. Now, the Star Tree Index, uh, no relation to Star Tree, the company, the Star Tree Index uh, serves a, a very common analytical use case. When you're filtering and aggregating, there's a particular metric that you want to aggregate, and some aggregation, say summing over some number, and there's one, two, maybe three. Uh, dimensions that that might show up in the where clause that you might filter by. And you may not know which ones, they may show up in some combination, but you've got that kind of small set of filter dimensions, that one metric that you want to aggregate. This is bread and butter for an analytics database, right? It's not the only thing that Pinot can do, but it's a very common thing. And this just optimizes the daylights out of that kind of query. Let me give you a quick idea how it works. So here is some ad impression data. Now you see impressions over on the right there, and we've got those three dimensions, country, browser, and locale. And you could imagine we would want to slice and dice this data and, and see what are the total ad impressions for all my Chrome users or all my Spanish speaking users or everybody in Canada or you know whatever it is uh, that you're doing. And you wanna do that very fast. Now, this is the only time in Pinot 
at the time of this recording, that there's any kind of pre-aggregation. Pinot does not work by pre-aggregating things, but the star tree index does work by pre-aggregation. So what it does is it builds this tree in the index, persists it to disk. Conceptually, if you know what a pivot table is, this is like building a pivot table and saving it to disk. But this tree structure is, is how it's stored on disk. And, and then when we're, we're looking to get a particular uh, value, let's just zoom in over here. Say I want to filter just by Safari users. Like I don't care what country, I don't care what locale. You know, I'm going to navigate this tree. Okay, country star. I'll go to I'll go to country star. I don't care what country it is. Then I'll go down a level. Browser Safari. Okay, looks like that's a a, a number there. I see 400. I I have pre-aggregated in this index. I can just read out of the index Safari users 400. Uh, now let's say I I want uh, locale uh, Spanish. I don't care what country. I don't care what browser. I just want locale Spanish. I'll go through those two. Country star, browser star, and the locale ES. Ah, there we go, 500. If I do want all of the Firefox users in Canada, I'll need to traverse over to Canada and say, okay, uh, under Canada, browser, Firefox, that's, that's 200. I already have that there. Or uh, all of the French speakers in Canada. I'll go to Canada, browser wildcard, down to locale French, that's 200. So all of those aggregates, regardless of what combination of my three dimensions, they're already stored in the index. And so when you run benchmarks on this, people's first response is, oh, something's broken, that must be cached, it can't be that fast, but it is. Slight trade-off in space, of course. Uh, it creates a bunch of documents to store in the index, uh, that are all of the combinations of the dimensions and the pre-aggregated impressions like you see here. So I don't know if that felt quick, but that's a very quick overview of the primary index types in Pinot. And I think it's important that you have the basics of those down so you know what kind of selections you can make when you're planning the design of your tables. Oh,